I trust in the Lord's steadfast love, and my heart shall rejoice in the gift of salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for I have experienced the bounty of the Holy One. Let us worship our God.
magnificent invocation found in your bulletin. Eternal God, help us to worship in spirit and in truth, for we desire to burn the ways of your love. As we come together, may we connect in a common witness of hospitality and healing, forgiveness and peace. May we covenant to love each other, to agree to disagree, to restrain from speaking of the kindly of others, and to avoid all forms of unfaithfulness. Bless this congregation and all the communities of faith in this area as we minister in our partnership and seek to bring your blessings to the world. Now guide our time together in making this service of installation a true consecration of a new ministry here at Cypress Creek Christian Church. Amen. Christian Church Disciples of Christ 
installation service for Reverend Bruce Froge, who has been called to be the senior minister at Cypress Creek Christian Church. We join together with our members, members from other Disciples of Christ congregations, and members from the larger interfaith community to ask God's blessing on this ministry and this church as we seek to serve Him. or what we know as the Old Testament is Isaiah 43, 18-19. I invite you to listen to these very important words. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making the way of the wilderness and streams of the wilderness. Thank you. 
It is with great joy that I read to you from the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verse 7 through 10. Beloved, I am ready to no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new commandment that is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says, I am in the light, while hating a brother or sister, is still in the darkness. Whoever loves a brother or a sister lives in the light, and such a person there is no cause for stumbling.
and for 20 years I have looked forward to that day each year. It's something like the anticipation and excitement and even anxiety that we bring to a new day like today. Cypress Creek Christian Church has been readying itself for this beginning for quite a while now. You've made this journey since the day that you celebrated Glenn's retirement. Parts of that journey were difficult. Parts of the journey brought learning and growth. Your leaders were remarkable, though. Clothed in prayer and in pure determination to see this journey through to the next step. Led faithfully by Sarah Raven, who I need you to know church leaders. But your leaders, all of them, turn to God faithfully in prayer and in thanksgiving and in times of conflict and in times of struggle and in times of confusion and in times of hope. And when they found themselves on their knees and other parts of the journey had them jumping with joy, with excitement and anticipation. And here we are. Beginning this ministry, with a new senior pastor. And as this partnership in ministry has gotten underway, Bruce brings his own journey to merge with that of Cypress Street, his own learning and growth, as he and Donna have journeyed with others like you, praying and thankful, experiencing times of struggle and confusion, conflict and hope, times he has been with faithful people like you who have been sometimes on their knees and at other times jumping for joy. <clears throat> and then this text from Isaiah kind of brings us a jolt. Forget the former things, as Jessica read for us. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and a spring in the wasteland. I love to focus this text in the lens of some of Paul's letters because in Ephesians he reminds us that one time we, Paul reminds us we were without Christ. Or as it reads in 1 John, we were in the dark, having no hope. But now, in Christ Jesus, once you were far off, you have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. You who were in the dark, you are now walking in the light. It's a new day. You're a new person. It's a new life. You're a new community. God has given us new life together, made known in Jesus Christ. Now what are we supposed to do with it? What are we supposed to do at the beginning of this kind of a journey? Well, I can't forget that Isaiah text. First of all, I can't believe in the Bible it tells us to forget the things of the past and don't dwell on them. I've had several members of congregations that I have pastored that didn't know that was in there. The way we've always done things. Somewhere that got written right after Jesus said, Peter, build my church. <laughs> I think the people started saying, we've never done it that way before. <laughs> and it also means that the glory day to which most congregations fondly reminisce, usually when there are thousands of people in worship in the congregation and the doors were bursting, Scenes. Even my little congregation in Whitewater, Texas, where the sanctuary would only hold 150 people, tell the story of 400 people being in worship. <laughs> the scripture says, forget about that. Don't dwell on it. 
or whatever it was that you have idealized in your mind's eye, and that has become the measuring stick by which you measure everything that is new and everything that causes change to happen and might cause us to rethink or reconsider or do something differently, forget. Don't dwell on Instead, see with your eyes and your spirit and your mind and your heart that God is doing a new thing. Not an old thing over and over and over, but a new thing. Again and again and again. Wow. And this new thing, it is bright. Walking in the light, my friends, not in the darkness, in the light of God made known to us in Jesus Christ. Last week, my husband Dave and I were preparing a guest room for my sister and her husband to visit. Every time they would come to visit, we noticed that they got up really, really early. Well, I had an occasion when I hurt my back to spend the night in that bedroom, and it is very light in that room at the crack of dawn. The light just comes in the room and you can't sleep anymore. So we found these great curtains guaranteed to make the room dark. Well, we put them up. In the middle of the day, it was darkness. And right as I was working on this text, I had so much fun closing the curtains, darkness, opening the curtains, light. My husband came and asked what I was doing. I said, I'm studying for my sermon. He said, it looks like you're opening and closing the curtains. <laughs> it seems so simple, though, doesn't it? Close the curtains and there's darkness. Open the curtains and there's light. That's the wisdom of our John text. Listen to this version from Eugene Peterson's translation of the message. My dear friends, I'm not writing anything new here. This is the oldest commandment in the book, and you've known it from day one. It's always been implicit in the message you have heard. Perhaps it is new, freshly minted, as it is in both Christ and you. The darkness on the way out and the true light already blazing. God really is doing an incredible thing, friends. We just open the curtains of darkness in our lives and see God's light at work. In fact, I'm convinced that God is opening those curtains in all of our lives, growing us up as followers of Jesus, and that God is doing a new thing even right here in the midst of us. Are we ready? Are we paying attention to God's presence in our midst, to God shining in the darkness, to God growing us up for ministry and mission in the world? I have the privilege to be in many, many congregations, and I see a lot of exciting and wonderful ministry happening across our region and across the whole church. And here at Cypress Creek are some exciting, light-giving ministry opportunities happening. And I've been studying and I've been making notes, and I want to share just a few keys about what I think it means to be a light-giving, light-revealing congregation in the 21st century. Disciples congregations that are living in the light, and you may recognize Cypress Creek in some of this, they are living in God's light as spirit-led, community-building congregations. They inspire people to grow in their faithful life as a Christian in regular, meaningful, faith-stretching worship. That happened here today twice. Worship that was well-planned and well-executed and spiritually focused. Worship that is centered at the table. Worship that is full to overflowing with excellent music and lots of prayer and faithful biblical preaching. Light living disciples' congregations are grounded in scripture, my friends, open in prayer and engaged in actively listening to God's lead. 
not just biblically literate, biblically fluent. All the leaders and many of the members are actively engaged in Bible study and reflection. A discipline of prayer is taught and practiced. And opportunities for Bible study and prayer together as community are abundant. Light revealing congregations call forth each one's gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. Not as an afterthought, but there is a clear calling for the gifts and the affirmation of them. There is a dependence upon God to provide the leaders that are needed for the ministry to which God has called. Live living, live revealing conversations practice gospel hospitality. That's not the Texas fictitious and sweet tea kind of hospitality. It's the hospitality taught by Jesus. It's an encouraging environment where respect and care for one another is the norm. There is intentional room made for including those who are new and helping them to learn their Light-revealing congregations engage the world around them in significant ways. Budgets reflect investment in outreach. Congregational calendars reflect the variety and frequency of ministry shared beyond the walls of the congregation. And as one person put it, these congregations are engaged in making the good news of Jesus Christ visible and vital. In the community. And finally, the light living congregations practice new thing openness. They're willing to engage their imaginations in following God's lead in their lives. I see folks asking God openly for crazy and seemingly impossible things. Preparing for the next 50 people God is bringing, and then the next 50, not in order to grow in numbers, but in order to grow in faith and to bring other people to God's wonderful spirit. You know what about the pastors of these congregations? They're energetic, they're faithful, they're human, not perfect, don't have all the answers. Faithful followers of Jesus Christ. They believe that God is at work in our world in ways that will truly make a difference. They lead well. And they engage others in ministry in ways that make a difference. But they need time for self-care. They need time for prayer. They need time away. And they need time for their family. Some of that sounds familiar to you, doesn't it? I could have written some of that after spending time at Cypress Creek. Friends, I am grateful for the 40 years of ministry that have happened here. And most importantly, I am looking forward to seeing the ministry that happens in the next weeks and months and years as again and again and again. You are leaning toward God's light. Seeking to be the people God is calling you to be today and tomorrow. You are the light of God made known in Jesus Christ. Shine brightly in this community. Reflect God's best light revealed. Stretch to reach that which God sets ahead of you. In a caveat. Some days it won't work. And we take a deep breath. We focus our prayer life, center ourselves again on God's call to the future. And we go just like a child to the next experience of the first day of school. And we experience the anticipation and excitement, and even a little bit of its anxiety, as again and again and again, 
God leads us forward. In the name of Jesus Christ, may it be so.
I reaffirm my belief in Jesus Christ and commit myself anew to following him as a disciple. Do you reaffirm your ordination vows? I reaffirm my ordination vows and promise by the grace of God to faithfully do the work of ministry, including preaching and teaching the message of Jesus, ministering to those who are sick, sharing in the leadership of this congregation, serving the broader denomination and its ministries, and encouraging the building of God's reign of peace and hope. I invite the members of Cypress Creek Christian Church to please stand. Do you, the members of Cypress Creek Christian Church, renew your faith in Jesus Christ, and your commitment to follow in his ways, if so, please say, we do. We do. As members of the church that is called Bruce Roche to be your pastor, you commit yourself to supporting him with your prayers and encouragement, and you promise to partner with him in the work of Jesus Christ. If so, please say, we do. We do. You may be seated. I would like to invite the staff of Cypress Creek Christian Church to please stand. Do you, the members of this congregation staff, offer yourselves to the work and ministry of Cypress Creek Christian Church? And as colleagues in ministry, do you offer your God-given gifts to help sustain and encourage Bruce in this ministry? If so, please say, we do. We do. You may be seated. I heard Danny speak over and over again about a new thing. I think I would prefer sometimes just doing the old thing over and over again because it is easier. But that is not what God has called us to be about. When I was ordained a little over 19 years ago, 
at First Christian Church in Lincoln, Nebraska, I knelt before that congregation and the elders of that church and elders from other congregations and ministers came forward and laid hands on me. Among the first people to uh, come forward was one of the elderly members of First Christian Lincoln. He was the first to put his hands upon me. And as the prayer of blessing continued, I guess standing was difficult for him because his hand upon me got heavier and heavier and heavier as he pushed me down and I tried to push back and he pushed down and I pushed back and I thought, Lord, is this a metaphor for ministry? <laughs> but you know, in that moment as it concluded and I was helped to my feet, I looked out and there was this amazing community around me. And this day, and I'd even have to say these past few weeks, as we have already dealt with some important issues, some tough things, again and again and again, what I have found is this amazing community that when the weight has well, gotten pretty heavy, there have been those that have quickly picked me up. And I've realized that that weight is not something that simply rests upon me, but it is a shared experience. This day, I want to give thanks to each of you, but also give thanks to other faith communities, other congregations that are represented, because we are a congregation that centers ourselves in this community, and we see ourselves as partners. And I truly believe that my ministry here will be a partnership. As we prepare for a time of prayer, let us join together in song.
kind people. We often find in Scripture, both the Hebrew Scriptures and the Christian Scriptures, the Old Testament and New Testament, a phrase that is troubling to some. It's troubled me at times. Where it speaks about a fear of the Lord. I've never quite understood that because... In 1 John, it speaks about how the pure love of God casts out all fear. So how do we fear the Lord? Though there have been days where I have feared the ministry that God has called me into, there are days when I find my knees shaking as I look upon this task. But it was helpful when when a professor of mine said that maybe the word fear that we find in Scripture needs to be retranslated. That Hebrew word could be translated as awe. You know when you go to the edge of a cliff, maybe to the edge of the Grand Canyon, and you look over, and you find your knees shaking, as you are just in awe of what you see. There is, there is fear, there is terror, there is awe, there's just this rush of emotion. Sometimes when we experience the presence of God, that is our experience. And it isn't that we have to be terrified of God. Never. For God is love. But sometimes when we come across that kind of love, it's like stepping to the edge of the cliff and just feeling our knees shake a bit and feeling that that part of our stomach beginning to rise up and we... But we know that ultimately we have nothing to fear. You know, I think there is no better place for us to be reminded that there is nothing to fear than around a table. I can think of so many memories in my life when I, I sat around a table. It might have been a family table. It might have been at my grandparents' house in Alliance, Nebraska. It might have been at a friend's home. But where we shared together in a meal, and there was something about the fellowship, the connection, the the sense of family that cast out all fear and brought us into the presence of that love that knows no bounds. I invite you to join together in song as we prepare, prepare for a time at the table. As I talked about just moments ago, one of those meals was at my grandparents' house in Alliance, Nebraska. And when it wasn't just my immediate family there visiting grandpa and grandma, but it was also my uncle and aunt and their kids, the table was not big enough. And so there was a card table and a kid's table, but it was just amazing how even if a guest showed up, Somebody unexpected came around dinner time. Another 
leaf was put in the table, another chair was pulled up, room was made, and there was always plenty to eat. One of the great fears in life is believing that there's not going to be enough. There, somehow, at the end of the day, I'll be the one left with nothing. Well, at the table of faith, what we discover again and again and again, a reminder of who our God is, is that there is always enough. In fact, there is plenty to the point of always having leftovers. This table is an expression of that good news, an expression of a God who always has more than enough. As we prepare for this meal, let us hear the words of institution shared in song. Jesus sat at supper with all of his disciples. He took the bread and blessed it and gave it to them, saying, This bread it is my body which is broken for you, and all of you. The blessings of God find so many ways of touching our lives. There are people that bring goodness and grace. There are symbols that remind us of who we are and whose we are. And there are simple things, like bread and a cup, that tell us we belong to God. Later on he took the cup, gave thanks and had them drink it. This bread is my body, which is broken for you. And you must now remember this. When you drink of this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. Let us join together in prayer. Eternal, holy God, by your word, we know that where two or three are gathered, you are there. We feel your presence in this place. We praise you for bringing us together in this community of love through your Son, Jesus. We remember his sacrifice for us through this cup and this bread. We ask that you open our hearts, our minds, and our souls to receive your blessing as we come to your table. In the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. In just a moment, we will share communion by what is called intention. There will be people standing up front and at the back, and they will have bread and cup. And you can take a piece of bread and dip it in the cup and partake of the elements. Within our tradition, all are welcome to share in this meal. It is the great agape meal, the meal of love and grace. And any time that Jesus broke bread and shared a cup, all were welcome to participate.
We have been called together by the grace of God, not only members of this congregation, but of other disciple congregations in the area, as well as other faith communities who come to simply say they care, they are supportive. And I tell you, that is such a gift, such a blessing. But most importantly, I give thanks for this congregation, an amazing congregation that already in those moments when my knees have been shaking, you have been there. You have already stood beside me at moments, and it just tells me that the new thing that God is already doing is not something I have to do alone, but you will be there. In fact, you may be the ones who are leading, and I'm just trying to catch up, and that would be okay. God is the one who calls us together, but God is the, also the one who prepares us to re-enter the world as people who have been slightly changed, people who have been shaped in a new way and prepared to go out and touch other lives. May we find that blessing and may we be ready, as Abraham and Sarah discovered, that we are called to then become that blessing to the world. If you are able, I invite you to stand and to join your voices on our song of discipleship. Thanks be 
you, God. Amen. We would now love to invite you to join us for a reception in Bruce's honor. You can meet Bruce, you can congratulate Bruce, and we would love to have you share refreshments and fellowship with us. It's in the gym, which is the building behind the building behind you right now.